Welcome to the fourth Sunday in Advent as I invite the Sadie family forward for the lighting of these candles, Jim, Kim, Spencer, and Emma. fourth Sunday of Advent. Christmas is almost here, but not quite. Still, we are bending our music today toward Christmas, and we hope it fills you with joy. My Bible study will be held this Thursday, December 23rd, in person and on Zoom. We will not have class the week between Christmas and New Year's. Just a reminder that on Christmas Eve, we will offer an online service that should be posted by 1 p.m. on YouTube, searching WBTS Church. We will also hold an in-person service at 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve. We will have a nursery for those five and under. We still ask unvaccinated people to mask, and we encourage others to consider whether they wish to mask or not, since there will be a lot of singing. Please be careful with yourselves and with others. Now let us sing praises as we recall the prophet Isaiah describing the coming of the Messiah.
Jesus, we want the tablets of our hearts to be clean, ready to welcome our Savior. Join me as we pray this prayer to God. Gracious God, we are glad that you chose to always be with us. We confess that we do not know how to welcome your presence in our lives. Sometimes hope seems elusive, and we get busy with the season. Sometimes we give brusque retorts to others during the strain of this holiday season. Please forgive us and help us to hope to be forgiven by others. John called for repentance, and then Jesus offered forgiveness. If you have repented of sins, Jesus offers you forgiveness. What good news that is. Thanks be to God. said he was uh, had the spirit of the Lord on him to bring good news to the poor and many different people in the world are poor for many different reasons so we at uh, the church and the members of the church seek to do what Jesus asked us to do my friend and elder Ann Nussel represents our outreach committee and outreach has many different people who work in that area for example over here, it says HUM, which means Halifax Urban Ministries, and that is a feeding program to help feed hungry people, more than 200 a day just in Daytona Beach, except during the COVID time. We reach people all over the world with our missionaries that we support here. And then right here, you know that there was, perhaps you know, there were uh, several tornadoes that went through the center of our country and devastated people. We have Presbyterian Disaster Assistance that is there right now. That's people who are helping people find shelter and water and care. We also um, have uh, Presbyterian Counseling Center. It's, there are seven locations and one of them is here on our property and counselors work to help people uh, find their way when they have struggles and problems. We are happy that there is somebody in the community, um, in the church, that has uh, had a heart for a place called Hope Place. They turned a, an old elementary school into a place where people can live and get on their feet. So these are socks for people in Hope Place. Some wonderful socks that are in here. And then uh, Tobias Kasky uh, still picks up items for what are called Friends of Francis welcome bags. He takes them to uh, men that are struggling and working to get on their feet, and they and their families appreciate what we do. So uh, Anne is here just as a reminder that there are a lot of people, but she is the one through whom they work for, to be able to do all of this good work. I think Jesus would be so proud that we are doing things in our community. And we also took bags to those who couldn't come to church. We took them this past week. And we also have gifts for children that wouldn't have Christmas without it. All these things we're doing, and I think it would put a smile on Jesus' face and perhaps on your face too. Let us pray. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the reminder that we are to carry out your ministry because we are your people. As we do so, may we bring health and hope to those at Christmas and throughout the year. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us pray. God of the prophets, open our hearts and minds now to one of the most revered prophets of the season. Let us also hear the words of Jesus and act on his teaching for our own lives. Amen. 
Hear now the word of God from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. Comfort, comfort now my people, tell of peace, so says our God. Comfort those who sit in darkness, mourning under sorrow's load. To God's people now proclaim that God's pardon waits for them. Tell them that their war is over. God will reign in peace forever. For the herald's voice is crying in the desert. lesson comes from the gospel according to Luke chapter 4 verses 16 through 21 when Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. When I left seminary, I remember my preaching professor's guidance that a sermon was intended to instruct, inspire, and delight. Since I left seminary in 1981, fewer and fewer people seem to know their Bibles, even if they own one. 
Some get piecemeal answers from the internet or make leaps of understanding on their own. So the goal of preaching in our day needs to be weighted toward instruction. I committed to a church-wide series of classes and sermons on the theme of hope for December. On the 5th, I told the story of the uh, Genesis story in, of creation with God creating everything and juxtaposed it with what the mythical-leaning John said about the sun, known as the Word, being present in the beginning along with the Spirit. Genesis is grounded in actions by God, while John described creation with the skill of an artist. With all of that in mind, we think about the next lesson, which I talked about. We should hope that God is still looking for people to be holy collaborators, just as God last week we discussed described uh, inviting Moses to be a holy collaborator to lead the Hebrew people out of Egypt. And God also called on Mary and Joseph to be holy collaborators in the unbelievable request from an angel to be mother and stepfather of God's son. They said yes, and we have been invited to say yes to God's request that might come our way. Today, as we continue to embrace hope-filled messages, we once again connect our Old or First Testament passage with a New Testament passage. First, we examine Genesis and John, then we considered Exodus and Luke, and today we examine Isaiah and Luke with a grown Jesus beginning to announce the purpose of his ministry. Did you hear that? Jesus in his own hometown was announcing the purpose of his God-instructed work. Could it be that what Jesus' purpose was then is a purpose he hopes we will carry out now? It is interesting that when Pastor Rick Warren published his wildly successful book, The Purpose Driven Life, neither our Isaiah passage nor our Luke passage was included in that book. But our Lord Jesus on that fateful day in Nazareth described his purpose in a dramatic reading and for all to hear. Will we pick up his mantle and carry on the purpose-driven life he described for himself? Well, first, let us see what Jesus decided to change when he was quoting Isaiah. I often find inspiration and instruction as I read hymns and carols and learn the background uh, concerning them. I was struck when I read an original verse of a beloved Christmas carol, O Come All Ye Faithful. With words that clearly came from the Nicene Creed, one verse has been radically changed or even omitted in many hymnals. An original reading of the second verse had these words, God of God, light of light, lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb. Very God, begotten, not created. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. My, what an awkward sentence. God abhors, not the virgin's womb. Our hymnals included that verse, but made the one line much less harsh. harsh Born of a virgin, a mortal comes. Hymn editors make changes like that over the years, and Jesus chose, it seems, to edit out a line of Isaiah's description of what the kingdom will be like when the king of kings would lead it. Isaiah offered these words. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. God has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and here's the part Jesus omits, and the day of vengeance for our God. 
Jesus edits that part out of his proclamation, even though it was clearly in the scripture he was reading from Isaiah. Jesus' purpose is specific, almost exactly what Isaiah said, but not quite. No day of vengeance is described in Jesus' proclamation. So second, as we move to Luke chapter 4, we find Jesus back in his hometown at the very beginning of his ministry. He is ready to begin that for which he has been preparing all of his life. He has been tested by the devil and he has come out uh, of the desert. So he chooses to go to his local synagogue. Many people over the years have loved to quote the title of Thomas Wolfe's novel, You Can't Go Home Again, as if it were gospel. And Jesus certainly found his visit home a rough one. Who would have known that Jesus said those words, even without the proclamation about a day of vengeance, uh, and, and that when he did, the townspeople would drive Jesus out and try to stone him? Who would have guessed? Wow, it seems that it was fine for the Spirit of the Lord to be upon Isaiah, but not fine for the same Spirit to alight on Jesus. Listen to Jesus' edited version of Isaiah's words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What message was God trying to send Israel? What message was God trying to send Nazareth and Jerusalem through Jesus? And what message might God be trying to proclaim today, perhaps through me or through you or someone you have heard in the world? Third, as fewer people listen to words from preachers in church pulpits, as fewer support or attend churches, we wonder what the next reformation of the church might be like. After all, about every 500 years historically, the church has gone through a reformation. The last one was now 504 years ago. Could we be on the cusp of our reformation brought on in part by the pandemic? As many in our workforce are stepping away from their jobs, we have vacancies for pastors all over the country. What might be the next phase for congregations? Well, back in 1996, novelist John Updike wrote a book about a minister who had lost his faith in God. I asked for the book for Christmas and got it, and the hook for me was it was about a Presbyterian minister. I was expecting an uplifting story like reading Catherine Marshall's true account of her Presbyterian minister husband, Peter Marshall, in her book, A Man Called Peter, which I thoroughly enjoyed. But this novel was not that. It was about a man who had lost his faith in God. Still, I read it, the title, In the Beauty of the Lilies. The character in the book was Clarence Wilmot, commenting on that character, uh, is Carol Lackey Hess, who was Associate Professor of Religious Education at Candler School of Theology in Atlanta. She wrote, Clarence Wilmot, who lost his faith in God, uh, in the God he was taught about in seminary, that God was rationalistic and all-powerful and in control. That God made no sense to him in the light of the poverty he was seeing around him. At one point in his ministry, Wilmot decided against expanding the church buildings. He could not justify adding underused ecclesiastical structures when poor people down the street slept six to a room." Unquote. Well, Wilmot in this novel left the ministry and began peddling encyclopedias to people who could not afford them, but bought them anyway. 
The book was depressing and unsatisfactory, but it brings into focus a call from Isaiah and a purpose declared by Jesus. What is our purpose in the world? According to our Lord, it is to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. In the magnificent words shared to remember the life of Senator Bob Dole a week ago, Francis of Assisi was quoted, who uh, Francis said, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. Amen to that. So finally, we together are preaching the gospel each week in so many ways beyond these walls. By bringing food contributions according to the reverse advent calendars many of us are following. That resupplies our Port Orange food pantry and we have people in the congregation who have staffed that pantry. We also have church members who are actively working with our local Habitat for Humanity chapter, building decent places for people to live. We have people in our church whose funds have helped create food and housing for young families, some of whom have been highlighted in the news journal series called Food Brings Hope. 36 years ago, we committed to create a counseling center with other Presbyterian churches and to bring help and hope to people in many stages of dysfunction or sorrow and struggle, and we have active board members still today. We are also supporting commission pastor Tobias Kasky as he reorganizes a mission of Westminster called New Corinthians Community Mission at a location in Daytona Beach, soon to restart worship services and offer a 12-step program called Celebrate Recovery to help recently incarcerated or uh, addicted men back into society and more importantly, back into touch with God, their higher power. Many of them will be living in that new location. But unlike Clarence Wilmot's decision not to expand his church facilities, we just paid off our newest magnificent addition, Peninsula Hall, that we dedicated in 2015. We have done and are still doing all those things through your financial gifts, your food items, and your prayers. We are carrying out the next chapter of Jesus' purpose-driven life. We are following what Jesus believed he was sent to do on that fateful day in Nazareth because we are the body of Christ. He never looked back and neither should we. Let us always remember that we are the church and not a club. And as St. Francis one put, once put it, let's continue to preach the gospel at all times and to use words if necessary. Let us pray. Dear Holy Jesus, you have given us a sharp picture of our purposeful lives, a picture of what your kingdom might look like if we carry through with your plan. We will reach people dealing with hunger, bring help and hope to those recently incarcerated. We will acknowledge and act on the anguish of injustice, and see the great needs of people in our world. Let the servant church arise as your body to be your hands and feet and heart in all that we do. Fill us and use us, Spirit of the living God. Amen.
Before we begin our prayer, I need to announce to you that the Reverend George Painter died on December 15th. He was a longtime colleague of mine from uh, 1994 to 2006, uh, and we will very much miss him. There are no service plans at this time, but we are so um, sad to be sharing that news with you today, but wanted you to know. Of course, we will be praying also for the devastation across our country because of tornadoes. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, our Good Shepherd, we are afraid when we notice that we have wandered away from your sight and are glad when, we, when you see us and lovingly carry us back home on your shoulders. When we get our feet stuck in crevices of greed or lust or pride or idolatry or any other pitfalls, when you hear us cry for help, rescue us, we pray. On fitful nights when sleep is elusive because of tension, conflict, anxiety, or a lack of forgiveness, restore to us the joy of our salvation and the security to offer us as we give our fears and needs to you. For refresh our dry souls by inviting us to drink in the fresh waters of renewal and rest. Keep inviting us to dine at table with you so we will have food for our bodies and souls. Protect us from enemies by encouraging us not to wander from your side. Like the swimmers far from a lifeguard or the lamb that wanders from its mother, there are dangers in the world around us. When we are hurt, anoint us with oils that soothe our wounds and whisper words that heal our hearts. This week we especially pray for all across America who are devastated by the huge tornado damage caused last week. We can offer our prayers and others may travel to help or send financial gifts of hope. For those who are ill, we lift up our prayers. For those who are grieving, like the family and friends of George Painter, we lift up our prayers. For those who are traveling this week, we lift up our prayers. And for those who are rejoicing because of good news, we rejoice with them. Hear our prayers, dear Good Shepherd of our hearts and King of glory. And we are reminded that you taught your disciples to pray this prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is truly the season of giving gifts. And our, our Almighty God was in the uh, lead, giving us the greatest gift of all in Jesus. We invite you to give gifts to your church and to others so that others may know uh, the season of Christmas and the spirit of Christmas, and we invite that giving now.
Now go into the world and be the heart and the eyes and the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. And as you go, may God the creator, redeemer, and sustainer bless you now and in the week ahead.